All right, so let's get ready for our next talk. And um, please welcome together with me on stage, Mario Elsner, CTO from our portfolio company, Everest. Welcome, Mario. Hi, thank you. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the invitation to, to speak here on this conference. Um, yeah, as you said, I work for Evernest. We are a real estate brokerage company and my team is building software for real estate agents that they then use to become better, more productive, more efficient. Okay, and today I'm going to talk about embeddings, vector databases and the combinations with large language models. This is a topic that's kind of super dynamic, so I made the last changes to the talk, I think yesterday evening, um, but I hope it's gonna be enlightening and not be completely outdated tomorrow. So, when ChatGPT hit the public, this was like a huge thing. I mean, everyone knows this, AI research and development has been in the works for years now, but this was kind of a crucial moment where everyone suddenly got in touch and was exposed to what these models can do, including these scammers from YouTube, which uh, promise you to, to get super rich by, by using ChatGPT. It's actually quite funny when you look at the details because there's, a, there's an exponential scaling law in there. So if you write uh, 50 articles and sell them, it's $50,000 uh, instead of 100 for one. So what became apparent quite quickly is, I mean, this is how models are trained, by the way. You take data, in this case, huge corpora of text, more or less publicly available. You throw a lot of money at it to buy compute resources. And then you end up with a snapshot somehow of the state of the world or this knowledge base that you put in at some certain point in time. And if you don't further train the model, then the model is kind of static and fixed in its interior state. So you can then use that model like it was trained, but it will not, for instance, know anything about events that happened after the training data was recorded. And it will, of course, also not um, know anything about, for instance, your, uh, your, your company's data. But there's another thing. This paper is from OpenAI. I think this was when they somehow, when they first introduced GPT-3, and that's a property called two-shot learning, because what people realized is, okay, those models are pre-trained and they are static, but you can still, with the prompt that you give it, you can somehow introduce new context, small patterns like this follows from this, this is a case of this, what's this? Small kind of classification tasks, but also provided a piece of text and then ask it to well, either answer questions about it or summarize it, even if it's never seen this text or not even similar text in the training data. That's what's called future learning. And then what happened is people thought, okay, this is cool. So we can use those LLMs as a basis and add more context. For instance, you know, this is everywhere now these specialized assistants or specialized chatbots. Everything our employees need to kind of know about the company, questions they always ask, they can now ask the, those questions to a bot and we'll get answers because we've prepared this bot with context that's including these, uh, this knowledge that's kind of private and not in the model itself. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say we have some old accounts from our business from the last century lying around and we need to analyze this data. So we just take all this paper and digitize it and give it to the LLM as a prompt. And then we can ask stuff like any unusual transactions from the last century. But the catch is this isn't possible or at least it's limited because the LLMs have a so-called context window, which is the maximum number of text or tokens, more technically, that you can give as an input. And if you exceed this limit, then in this case, the API or the service will just reject your request. So you can't stuff huge pieces of context into an LLM just out of the box. 
Uh, by the way, here are some numbers for the current kind of sizes of context windows. Uh, GPT-4 has between 8 and 32,000. Claude 2 has 100K. Okay, so let's find a creative solution to still do this, right? So kind of select what context we should give the model. I mean, that's, of course, kind of the static case where you always give it the same context. Maybe if your company's knowledge base is pretty small, you could just get away with just providing it every time you ask it. But there's also other cases where what you want to provide is kind of dynamic and it depends on the questions being asked, the topic currently being discussed, or the task that you want the LNM to accomplish. Um, so earlier this year, a development started where we saw a couple of things. Like here on the left, this is um, OpenAI's function calling feature, where you can tell the model up front, okay, here's a couple of functions that I have on my side, and you describe them, um, what they do, what tasks they can accomplish, and then the model can at any point decide, well, I actually don't know what to do, I'm going to do a function call. Then it sends you the response, okay, please execute a function call. You then do that on your side, provide the result back, and it will then take that context and use it for accomplishing the task or answering the question. Um, the ChatGPT plugins that you might have seen um, are a similar development. And there's even like this blueprint uh, called the retrieval plugin, which they open source, which you can take and then take as a basis to build such plugins. And then you could register your own plugin in the store. And this is a lot of these plugins do a similar pattern. For instance, the AI PDF, you upload a PDF, and then that PDF can be used as additional context. Suddenly, the model knows about your PDF. And the third example is even more, one more kind of layer of abstraction, so-called agents, where you provide a couple of tools similar to those functions, so stuff that can be executed, stuff that can be looked up, data that could be changed, and you then have an LLM decide what tool to use. The difference is you can, uh, this is uh, an example from Langchain, you can actually build your own application with this, and you could, for instance, use a different LLM to steer the agent, um, and a second one to actually um, being asked in the end. Okay, so there's tech technology there to do this, but then we still have those books, right? So how do we then decide what could be the relevant piece of context here? I mean, we're, we're looking for something, maybe we have some additional knowledge, maybe we know it's from the 70s or from the 80s where those unusual transactions happened. Uh, so we need some way of deciding what to give to the model. We can't use everything, we've seen that, might, ex uh, might exhaust the context limit, but how do we do it? And this is actually where embeddings and vector databases come into play. So really short description of what those are. Embeddings are a way to encode text in the form of a vector, a pieces of text, with the super nice additional feature that semantically similar pieces of text end up as vectors which are close to each other by some similarity metric that you have to choose. So this is kind of, this is illustrating this. Lion is the king of the jungle, tiger hunts in the forest, kind of talking about the same thing. Everybody loves New York different. This is just two dimensions. Usually those embeddings are really high dimensional, like hundreds or even thousands of dimensions. And vector databases are then the databases where you can store those embeddings as vectors in Rn, as mathematicians say, in this case, three-dimensional space. The circles are individual vectors that are in your database. And the interesting thing is the lookup pattern, which is typically find k nearest neighbors to a query vector. So the blue vector is an incoming query, right? I'm interested in this vector because maybe I've computed an, an embedding of a question, and now I'm trying to find nearby vectors in my database. 
in this case, the three most similar actors. Okay, and the so-called rack architecture, when I started working on this talk, there wasn't even this term. Now it's already forget rag. <laughs> so it's really dynamic. But I think that's the point to still learn about these things because it's kind of a newly evolving stack that wherever it will end up sitting, more on that later, if you're going to work with it directly or it's powering other services that you use, it's still, I think, valuable to, to have a basic understanding. So what do you do here? You have an embedding model and you have a vector database and what's called proprietary data here, let's say, are all of our books, the shelf. We take the shelf, we scan it, you then chunk it up into smaller parts, like that makes some sense for context, maybe paragraphs of text. And then you put all these individual pieces of text, you compute embeddings and you put them into your database. Now, if a new question comes in, this user question, you compute the embedding of that, you do a lookup for some reasonable value of k nearest neighbors, you find the vectors, you compute the vectors back to the text that they represented, you concatenate it with the original question, and then you send it to the LLM. It's kind of the basic idea of this stack. Okay, and now I wanna do two kinds of deep dives for those topics to go in that uh, a bit deeper and understand a bit about how it works. So, still remember, embeddings map pieces of text to vectors and translate semantic similarity to close vectors. So how does that work? How do you get embeddings? I wanna highlight two uh, approaches from the literature. This is taken from the kind of first generation of embeddings that OpenAI had. They published this in a paper that's why I know this for, for the latest model that doesn't seem to be a paper. Um, so you have this model architecture here where you have an encoder. An encoder is basically like first half of a transformer model. It can take two pieces of text called X and Y. It has these special marker tokens for start and end of a sentence. And then the data you take to train this is just nearby passages from a large corpus. So maybe one sentence, the next sentence. Then you have the pair of X and Y. And the objective for this model is to be able to decide whether this pair is a nearby pair or whether it's kind of a counter example. So typically, this is a bit of a technical trick they do here. They don't need negative labels for dissimilarity. They just interpret appearing nearby as the label close and just random stuff from another piece from the corpus as dissimilar. Of course, you make some mistakes there, but it seems to work really, really well. And the um, loss function inc uh, incorporates cosine similarity. We'll see the formula for that in a bit. And then the kind of trick with embeddings in general is you then take the last internal hidden layer of the encoder, once it's uh, once it's completely trained, and that is always the encoding, uh, the embedding for a new input. So kind of you you kind of piggyback on the internal um, the internal representation of an input that a model has. That's kind of the basic ideas, the basic idea here. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, an interesting development because. Until some time ago, um, it wasn't really possible to compute embeddings for larger pieces of text. Like people could compute embeddings for single tokens, maybe a sentence, but those developments are quite recent. Yeah, another, this is a famous example. So SBIRT is actually an architecture that's based on the famous BIRT model and also does a little trick here. So this looks like it's two bird model, but it's actually the same. So it's one instance of a bird model. You then feed in the two sentences A and B. This computes because bird produces single tokens or embeddings for single tokens. You feed the sentences in token by token. You then have 
actually a matrix of, in this case, 512 token embeddings, each with dimension 70, uh, 768. And you then, this is the new thing that Asper does, have a pooling operation. I don't know, you might be familiar with pooling operations for uh, recurring, uh, recurrent neural networks. It's some way of kind of aggregating or averaging over the data. And that pooling operation is not hard-coded, but it's also learned with weights. And then you end up with a single embedding for this sentence. And due to the symmetry, it's actually, it doesn't matter if you take, uh, but no, since it's actually just one model that you trained, uh, there's no difference in the embedding between U and B. Just, again, you take the latest layer um, in the neural network, the weights of the last layer in this pooling operation, and that gives you the embeddings. Um, here they work actually with labeled data. They um, guide the model to penalize difference um, by adding this extra term here, which is the difference of U and V. This forces the model to, <clears throat> to actually um, to classify close vectors as similar. They have three different labels. It's, it's kind of a, a little bit of detail. They used a data set that was more like premise, consequence, and then either it makes sense that the consequence follows from the premise, or they are completely unrelated, or they contradict each other. And they had these three classes. This is what Asbert did. And now there's a couple of models on the market, the latest, so uh, actually OpenAI started uh, having specialized embeddings models for different use cases because sometimes it's not always similar sentences. Maybe you want, if you ask a question, you don't want to find another question, but an answer to the question. So you need to be careful with the training data that you put in. So your embeddings actually match more use cases. But the latest generation of embedding models didn't really have to be so specialized in training. It just generalized uh, pretty well. And those embeddings can now cover lots of use cases. OK, embeddings, hopefully roughly understood. Back to DBs, next deep dive. So we said, OK, we want this thing that we can store high dimensional vectors in. Then we come with a new vector, and we want to find the closest vectors from the store. That's basically what a vector DB does. The formulas you see here are three different types of similarity metrics. One is Euclidean distance that you might remember from high school math, maybe. Um, inner product is the second, and cosine similarity is the latest one. They have different properties. <coughs> For instance, um, inner product takes the angle of vectors into account, and cosine similarity is not um, taking the length of vectors into account, which you can see here because it's normalized away. That means actually cosine similarity just measures the relative position of vectors in space and treating them as if they were all of length one. It depends on the use case what metric works best, but what you should aim for, if you can, is store your database vectors using the same similarity metric that was used for the embedding model. Because if cosine similarity guided the notion of what is a semantically um, similar piece of text, then you also want the lookup to have the same notion of similarity. There's one problem, though, because if the data sets become large, then this lookup doesn't scale. It's basically a complete search every time because there might still be this other closed vector somehow that we haven't visited. So if you have large data sets in a vector database, you need some strategy to like an index structure basically. And then K nearest neighbor search becomes approximate nearest neighbor search. <coughs> Sorry for the voice. Um, and now you have different strategies of implementing this approximation. And this basically boils down to a couple of index types. And I want to highlight three of them. The first is called locality-sensitive hashing with 
random projections, <laughs> fancy name, but what you actually do is, so you have your points in vector space, and you want to simplify um, the lookup, so you compute another encoding of this vector, and this you do by choosing a couple of so-called hyperplanes or projections. These are these uh, green and red lights, and you need to choose the number wisely. Performance depends on how many you have. If you have too few, it, nothing is distinguishable. If you have too many, you're back to uh, full table scan, basically. So what you do then for each of these uh, hyperplanes, you decide whether your point is on which side of the hyperplane your point lies. You can do this by computing the inner product of the normal vector with your vector. And then if it's on the positive side, you encode it with a one. If it's on the other side, it's zero. So you have a binary vector that you end up with. And lookup works in the following way. You have an incoming proper vector. You compute the same so-called hashing functions for your new vector. Then you have um, to compare uh, two binary vectors. And then there's a similarity metric called Hamming distance that allows you to do that. The second thing is kind of cool. It's called hierarchical navigable small world, another fancy name. And here you build your index structure by building like a hierarchical sequence of subgraphs where edges on the graph are neighboring relationships between vectors. The how you compute this index structure part is super complicated. I'm not going to explain it here, but the lookup is quite nice. So this is made in a way that you always start at the top layer when you have a query coming in. So the blue one is the query vector. And this is built in a way so that you do most of the traveling on the top layers and then the more fine-grained getting closer to your actual result on the, on the uh, lower layers. So what you always do is, you visit the next vertex, you decide how close is it to the query vector, you try the next vertex, if it's far further away, you stop, you go back, so you do like a greedy search for the closest thing on this layer, and if you finished, you found the local minimum, you go to the next layer and you do the same, and at some point you arrive at the bottom layer, and then you find the local minimum here, and that's your candidate for retrieval. And a third indexing <coughs> approach is called an inverted file index, where you take all of your high dimensional space and you separate it into regions called Voronoi cells. This works by choosing certain centroid points and then enlarging the area until they start hitting each other. And then you <coughs> you've separated your space into certain blocks and the lookup is then, you check out where your query vector is, in which box is it, basically, and your retrieval candidates are just taken from this box. Or if you want to optimize a bit more, you can also allow it to also look in neighboring cells. Um, yeah, but so this kind of, you pre-structure your space, to kind of pre-compute neighbors. You sometimes make mistakes, but once the index is built, then the retrieval is actually super fast. Again, as with all, as with all of these structures and approaches, there's always a trade-off between accuracy and performance. Of course, the stupid lookup where you visit every vector is 100% accurate, but also expensive. And kind of the more uh, accuracy you sacrifice, usually the better the performance is. But you need to find a kind of a balance. Here's a couple of pros and cons. As I said, taking no index is okay when you just have small data sets or when it just doesn't matter that it takes an hour. Maybe there's a situation like that. LSH is good for low dimensional data or small data sets. The hierarchical small worlds is high quality and high speed, but the index is pretty big. And IVF is kind of a nice middle ground. Okay, so 
did a couple of details. Now let's tie it together again. So we've seen this picture already, but now with the technical knowledge that we have, we understand what's happening. Vector database is prepared with one of the index structures that we've uh, that we've chosen. Embedding model, we understood how it works. We, cho we, ch uh, we chose one, and then we can actually use this stack. Before we actually start, we go through our data, we all index it, it's all in the index, and then as I explained, new question comes in, we have a super fast lookup there, the embeddings are super good, embeddings and similarity metric in the database um, are kind of compatible, and then that's how it works when they all play together. Okay, so let's go and build it. Right? Sounds super nice, super interesting. This is cutting edge. There's 10 medium articles every day, literally, on this. Why it's, it completely sucks. Why, why it's the future. Everyone needs to go and implement it. But as always, it's kind of, yeah, OK. Let's look what's actually happening at the moment. I mean, of course, there's a lot of hype. And if you ask the vector database providers, they will tell you, this is, this is the technology of the future. Everything will be covered with vector databases. They, they have huge funding rounds. There's, I don't know, 20 providers already, a couple of open source, a couple of commercial ones. The big cloud providers also have offerings, so vector databases. But if you look at at least what the current databases are doing, I mean, it's kind of cool, but it's also very, very limited if you compare it to the feature set of relational databases. So I think a couple of possibilities could happen. And uh, here's some, some findings from a recent um, survey that Sequoia did. So 88% of the respondents believe a retrieval mechanism such as vector DBs would remain a key part of their stack. It depends a bit on the definition of what their stack is, right? So if I'm, if I'm using it as part of a managed service on GCP, yeah, it's kind of my stack, but I don't have developers working on this and optimizing the K and the number of render projections and so on and so forth. Um, second insight was every practitioner we spoke with said AI is moving too quickly to have high confidence in the end state stack, but there was consensus that LLM APIs, okay, will remain a key pillar, followed in popularity by retrieval mechanism and development frameworks like Langchain, open source, blah, 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 blah. Actually, my personal opinion is kind of like this, but I would reverse, I would say those frameworks like Langchain will probably be even more relevant for usual developers not working at the companies building the basic tooling. So a typical company building a product, you might need to kind of work with those retrieval mechanisms on, you, on your side, or you might not. I think it's, it's good anyway to have your engineers understand what this is doing and also what the limits are and the possibilities, but that's kind of typical for these service, uh, these service. At the moment, it's super hot, so yeah, it's definitely going to stay, definitely. Um, but the third point is also interesting because foundational models and cloud databases may embed retrieval directly into their services, and this has already happened. Right? So there's like AWS Open Search, there's the Azure Copilot stack, where this is all already kind of integrated. So as, as often nowadays, you work, you do integration things with tools that are offered to you, and it's fine. Still need to understand what you're doing. Um, another possibility is, okay, you could look at it this way, this rack architecture is somehow working around a current limitation of large language models. Right? So the context window is finite, but what if the context window is 100 times what it is now? I mean, you can still find bigger data sets that won't fit in there, and it's not very likely that this will happen since increasing the context window also, uh, it makes training the models a lot more expensive. You need more data. Data is already kind of exhausted by now, um, and it makes inference more expensive and slower. So might not happen. But there's other stuff, like now you can already, via API, fine-tune existing models, or you take an open source model and fine-tune it for your use case. That consumes resources, but this may also, if, if we see more breakthroughs in efficiency for training, 
could also be the go-to solution in two years. I think it's just too early to say at the moment. Um, so I, I'm not going to say this is definitely what and three weeks ago it was a different situation. Um, there wasn't even a rack, as I said. Okay, maybe just to finish up, how do we do it at Evernest? Right, so as I said, we build software for real estate agents. Um, okay, we are also confronted with this development. We also want to do reasonable and meaningful things with it. But what we've so far did is, okay, first of all, we picked a couple of low-hanging fruits, like things that, are, that you can just build. Like for us, it was a feature allowing the uh, allowing the automatic writing of exposés for real estate properties. Uh, you probably know this from your personal life. You always get these lengthy kind of prosaic descriptions of uh, a flat or a house. And everyone hates writing these texts, but the market still, the people want it somehow. So we automated this. So you can just hit a button, you give some basic facts about the property that we have in the records anyway, and then you get a nice draft for this text. And it saves our agents like, I don't know, hours of work actually. That's one example. So other stuff that's currently in the works is, um, you're a real estate agent and you're about to meet with a client, um, maybe to show them a new property that might also be a match. You can hit a button and you get like a little survey in text about this client that we draw on different pieces of data, like past communications, activities, but also some more structured data, like number of expose this person has viewed. So you can get a quick kind of pre-meeting briefing um, for about this customer. And a third feature that's in the works is, um, we combine this actually with a reminder function. So it's important if you build customer relationships to get in touch at some point again and not leave people for years and then suddenly call them. So kind of keep the conversation going. And so we have some reminder features that not just remind you do something, but also suggest, for instance, the text of an email that already references some context of this customer. So it's not the standard static email, hi, let's get in touch again, but hey, remember a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we were looking at this property together. Uh, wouldn't it be nice? I know we've got some new stuff and so on. Well, it's kind of personalized client communication. Um, but what's really important to us is we're not completely shifting and doing everything with AI now, but we subject it to our known, normal kind of product discovery and delivery process and see it as a new enab enabling tool. That it's there now, it makes certain things possible that might not have been possible before, but it doesn't justify doing everything with AI, even if it doesn't make sense. So that's what I call no vanity features, just because, yeah, we need to do AI nowadays, otherwise you can go home. Um, we want to do it in a reasonable way. And yeah, and this is also yeah, like those developments I sketched in this talk. We monitor this situation pretty closely. We look at where different developments go, not just technical, but also from, for instance, UX and design is also pretty, pretty interesting. We try to really be at the forefront of this development and use for our work what makes sense to use. That's how you could summarize it, I guess. Okay. And that's it.